Rob DeSimone. I'm a, I'm a Gallup Strengths Coach. Um, and in a minute, you're going to understand a little bit more about these five words that are behind me. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, a couple of things before we start. One is I work with some of the biggest organizations in the world in terms of how they use their strengths. Um, that fifth word up there is one of my strengths themes, which is called belief. Um, and I think it's probably my favorite theme. And it's because I really, really believe in what strengths has to offer. I think all of you have probably re by now received a copy of your blind spot books. If you go to page five on that book, you'll notice that infamous curve, which is a line, and it's also on the cover. And it really shows how over the past five, six, seven years, whatever it's been, uh, sadness across the globe has really, really accelerated. And so I start with that because I think strengths actually has a lot of power to give people hope. And strengths has a lot of power to give people hope because uh, in the words of its founder, Don Clifton, when you're doing something to your best, to your fullest, that's what gives you hope because hope is something that it's almost like intent. It never, it never falters. It always propels you forward. And strength is really a way for you to live hope day in and day out. So what, what are Clifton's strengths and what, what are these 34 themes? So it requires a bit of explanation. Again, the founder of, of, of Clifton Strengths, Don Clifton, dedicated his life's work to studying high performance. And he wanted to find out, quite simply, what is it that the best do differently? And the short of it is he found that there are these 34 strengths themes that everybody has, or you can think about them as their 34 ways of seeing the world, 34 different ways of being good at something. But again, all in the spirit of trying to take what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how do you make it better it's by taking the way you see the world and developing specific skills around that. And over the past years, it's really become a movement. I mean, you can see some of the numbers and they really speak for themselves in terms of how many people are taking strengths, what the impact of strengths has been, but my favorite part of strength is actually not any of these bigger numbers. Uh, it's actually just one number in particular. And so I'm a father of, of two little girls. And I'm always telling these girls that, you know, how special they are to me and what a gift they are to the world and everything. And um, I think my girls are going to grow up to be scientists or engineers because they kind of say, well, yeah, well, what makes me so special? Show, show, show me some proof. And I'm saying, well, I love you. And they're like, well, no, no, I know you do, but I want some proof. Um, so maybe not yet, but when they're older, there's some stats that I want to share with them that I think help, help them to understand just how unique they are. And I think some of you might know a little bit about strengths, but um, we'll see if any of you know uh, these facts here. Does anybody know... What are the odds that somebody has the same top five Clifton strengths themes as another person? So it was one person in this room, it's another person in the room. What are the chances that you have the same top five? Any cheaters here? What's that? Low. One Google. That's probably the next one. This one is 1 in 278,000. 1 in 278,000 chance that you have the same top five strengths as somebody else. The chances that you have the same top five strengths as somebody else in the same order? Close to 1 in Google. 1 in 33 million. 1 in 33 million. So when they're older and they ask me how special they are, I'll have some, some math to back them up on it. But if you think about Clifton Strengths, 
and I think this will also probably be new for, for um, some of you Gallup folks in the room too. Uh, what, is, what is the one word that comes to your mind about Clifton Strengths? If you had a, if, if, if you didn't have me for until four o'clock uh, and you had to define it for yourself and I said you had one word, think about what that word would be that you would use to define it. And I just give you, you know, five or 10 seconds to, to think about what that word would be. My word is kinetic, which is all about motion. And the reason that I say that it's kinetic is because if you really start using your strengths and you really start feeling the energy that comes from it, that's how it feels. It feels like you're in motion constantly. So, as I told you before, um, I've got girls always asking me for proof, so I'm going to prove it to you. I'd like for you all to uh, get up. Uh, you can, we can stand up. <laughs> and I am going to give you, well, first I'm going to give you just, um, I'm going to flash that chart again, and I'm going to ask you all to look at that chart, study it, think about one strength that you know you have. You haven't taken the strengths there, but you, but you don't even need to take it to know this is how I see the world. Okay, so I'll show that chart. Pick it, and then once you've picked it, I want you to go around the room, and I want you to just two simple things. Find somebody, tell them the strength that you think you have and why, and then they're going to do the same thing as you, and we're going to see how many of those introductions you can do over the course of the next I'll give you five minutes to work the room. So those are your themes. I'll just give you, again, 20 seconds to study that. You can absolutely come up to me and ask me, say, I think I know... I think I have um, connectedness, but I want to know more about that one. So don't be afraid to flag me during this time. Otherwise, does everybody have their word? Either no one does or everyone does. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you five minutes. Go ahead. You got your theme. Just find as many people as you can. Why you picked it, why they picked it. Go. So for starters, how did that feel? Just talking about what you thought you're really good at. I'm seeing some nods like really good, yeah. I should do this more often at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, anybody want to share out kind of something that they learned either about themselves when they were talking or, or something that they heard that they thought was really cool? Uh-huh. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, go for it. Oh, sorry. Anybody else have any... Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And to add that, I felt like it really sparked curiosity. I was just really eager to learn like, how people identified how they saw themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I love these words, flow, curiosity, unique. These are not necessarily things that we typically think about. We show up to the workplace, but there's, there's no reason why they can't be. Um, so the next 30 minutes, our objectives are the following. We're going to try and give you three skills that I think, or maybe you can call them hacks, three hacks that are going to be, I think, key to understanding your strengths. The first of those is about filtering. So we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about, again, how we see the world, the way we see the world uh, through the lens of our strengths. Second piece is going to be around the strengthening. So what does it mean to actually pick a strength and to target it, to aim it at something in particular? And then the third one up there is about talent balancing. So, so what happens when we, when we overuse our strengths? How do you balance it? Uh, how, how do you move forward? All right. So um, it's going to be an eventful 30 minutes. And I get promise that won't be the last time that you, uh, you had a chance to do some share out. So, so pay attention so you know when to share. So f the first piece here is strengths filtering. And if you take a look at the way that Gallup defines talent, it is a naturally recurring pattern of thought, feeling, or behavior that can be productively applied. Okay. I always am a big fan of thinking that the best definitions require some illustration. So I think perhaps a better understanding of, of talent is this idea that it's a filter on how we see the world, right? So you can be given an input, and that one input that you get, depending on how you see the world, can result in completely different behaviors. I'll give you an example. Tomorrow, I'm going to be taking a flight. I can almost guarantee you there is going to be one stimulus that happens when, before I take that flight, hopefully not my flight, but there'll be one stimulus that happens, and then there will be a myriad of behaviors in reaction to the exact same stimulus. And that will be, you're sitting in front of the boarding gate, and it says, on time. And then suddenly, boom, delayed. And what happens? Not everyone reacts the same way, right? You got some people, ah. Oh, you know, now I'm going to be late, and I got to go talk to the flight attendant. I got to go to the counter. I got to find the, the next flight I possibly can. Other people say, "Oh well, you know, catch the next one. Not a big deal, right?" Other people say, "Wow, I was supposed to have, I was supposed to get in at seven. And I have a dinner meeting at nine. And I'm like, I'm going to do right." And they start analyzing all the all the scenarios. Um, and other people are like, "Well, sweet, the bar's still open. We can get a happy hour special maybe before we go on the flight." So how is it that the exact same scenario results in all these different types of reactions um, other than, other explain then, it's just simply how we see the world. We're seeing the world in these different ways. Now, right, that's a common, uh, common situation, but what does this mean in the workplace? Well, there are, are probably some things at work that you do when compared to others, actually can give you a clue to your talent and a clue to how you're seeing the, the world. So those things that you naturally yearn for, those things that you gravitate to, so I want to put my hand up for that, that is a sign of a clue to talent. Or um, hopefully some of you had the experience where you sat down and you started to do something, and then just like three hours later, you, you know, you closed your computer, but you were done with it, and it just felt great, Right? This idea of getting immersed in something and being uh, in, in a state of flow. Um, or rapid learning, right? Sometimes, you know, you, you get an assignment. And it's like, how did you do that? How did, how did you pick it up that quickly? Well, your chances are you were drawing on a talent that you actually had. Uh, glimpses of excellence. Is it, is it the case that there are just some, maybe this is, I think schools is probably the most obvious analogy, but it happens in the workplace too. Are there are certain situations where you just naturally always find yourself rising to the top, you get presence in the room. People are looking to you, right? Clue to talent. And the last piece there is satisfaction. Just, right, what, what, what do you like doing? And not for any reason other than because you like doing it, right? These are all strong, strong clues to talent. 
So my question to you, though, is it's strength is not just about how simply how we see the world. It's about applying it, right? So it's about taking a look at a specific issue or challenge that you have and then using your strengths to try and, and attack it, using your strengths to go after it. So it might sound a little bit ridiculous, but if we can go back to our, our airport analogy for a second, right? If, you, uh, if you're that person who you're, when you, the flight's canceled and your gut reaction is to go right to the counter and to get the next flight you possibly can, um, definitely fetter that for the benefit of your, of your uh, the staff there. But there's a strength at play there, right? And that, that, that strength, um, you know, well, it could be a number of things. Maybe it's, maybe it's achiever, right? Because you want to make sure that you're on time because you've got things to do, you've got places to be. Um, you know, it, it also could be, um, you know, maybe you're a later, right? Maybe you were trying to get somewhere because it was a special flight. You're trying to, you know, make, make a special event, whatever it is. But there can be reasons why we're behaving the way we're behaving when those strengths are at play. So being aware of our strengths also helps us to channel them to be more productive in the moment. So as I promised, right, we want to make sure that we're always moving, being kinetic. I'll you can stay in your seats this time too, although if you want to stand, that's perfectly fine, but you don't, I'm not going to make everyone move uh, for this one. But um, we're going to do a quick activity. You can write this down if you want. There's some research that suggests if you write things down, it actually helps you be more clear, more precise. But just take a quick 45 seconds and just write down some of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now. And just wrap up the thought you're on. And the next thing I want you to do is now maybe just take 20 seconds and focus, focus the one challenge that if you really focused on in the next couple of weeks, you could make a dent. You could solve it. You could substantially resolve it. You could make it better. And now I'll invite you to just simply, you can just pair up... Um, with the folks at your table. Um, if anybody is alone, uh, you can maybe join that group there so you, you can have a, you can tripod. Um, but go ahead and discuss, ask, them, ask your partner these questions. What's your challenge? And that one strength that we talked about before that you know you have, you're convinced of it, how might you be able to, to apply that strength um, to that challenge, to, to being more intentional? And I will, uh, I know that we don't, so we don't have time right now to define all 34 of those strengths, but I also will be uh, circulating in case, in case anybody has any specific questions about that strength that they know they have and we can workshop your situation. So we'll take, uh, we'll take five minutes on this one. And um, like I said, go ahead, have fun with it. I'll be, I'll be moving around. Um, part of discipline is you can be very structured and so I actually would love to give you all more time, but it's my job to keep us on time. So um, I heard a lot of, of great feedback there, a lot of great stories. I have, wonderful that you had a chance to pair up with your partner. We're going to do another rep or two like this, and I actually heard something uh, that somebody said on the floor that we're going to come to in a little bit. But um, the second skill that I wanted you to pick up uh, today was called strengths, uh, talent strengthening, sorry, I was about to say filtering, talent strengthening. So talent strengthening 
it's all about how we aim our talent. So you, you got a little bit of that in the last in the last session. Oh, I can I can I can filter my strength, can take a look at a situation, how do I apply it? But the fact of the matter is is that it's not all that easy um, to live your strengths because there's a talent, there's a way you see the world, but you need investment in order to really be living your strength. The Gallup definition of a strength is developing a task with near perfection, time in and time out, right? So in order to deliver that task with near perfection, time in, time out, it's not just simply, oh, I can draw on it. There are, oh, excuse me, there's skill that you need to have, right? Sometimes you need a technique and be able to, to, to actually operate with that strength. There's also knowledge that you need, right? You've obviously in our work, different, different um, ways of doing things. There are experiences that we need to draw from, right? As much as you can, you can you know, learn um, what are the top 10 ways to give a presentation or something, there's nothing quite like getting up in front of the audience and having them either look at you or not. Um, and then intention, the time and effort, right? Are you, are you trying to get better? Are you trying to apply that skill? So uh, this idea of being able to strengthen the talents that we have uh, simply means that we really need to have intention in order to do it. Now, how do we do that? How do we put intentionality into our efforts? Well, um, I think one of the biggest things that I learned and I, went, I actually went to business school. So one of the biggest things I've learned since business school is how much that my management courses got it wrong. By the way, the, I, I, was, I was terrible at my management courses, very, very, very low scoring. But, but this slide, or this actually explains why. So we have two parts of our brain. And in business school, and probably a lot of the management books that are out there, they're really good at telling our rational parts of our brain what to do, right? Uh, and that's useful because, right, that's, they're trying to slowly introduce us to information, get us to make the right decisions. The problem is that that's only about 30% of the time that your brain's operating in that space. There's a whole 70% of your time where you're doing actually not thinking at all and you're literally just moving in the moment. Uh, the favorite example here is there's a, um, uh, I think his name is Robert Klein, but he talks about if you were in front, of a, in front of a bus and you used your system two brain, you could measure the distance between you and the bus, measure how fast the bus is coming, and make a calculation to determine whether or not you have time to move out of the way, or you can use system one and you can just move out of the way. Of course, we all use system one, but the reason why that applies to strengths is because with the use of strengths, you can actually try and make a conscious choice, right? Use that rational part of your brain that you have in system two and turn it into a habit. And if you do it enough and you're consistent enough and if you try enough, you can actually move something, a learned habit from system two to system one in your brain. And you can think about how much more effective you are if you're doing something in system one. They've actually done um, additional psychological studies that shows, for example, those people that are really good at a task, that they just have that, if you will, system one attainment of it, doesn't matter how much pressure you, you put on them, they're gonna just do it when the pressure's on. And if you haven't attained it, you're gonna use system two and you're probably gonna choke in the clutch. Okay. So, how does this apply to the idea of, of talent strengthening? Well, there's a couple of questions that I want you to um, think about right here. Um, and these really are some reflection questions for you, right? But think about either the skill, knowledge, experience that you have. We've got some people taking pictures. That's awesome. Um, but right, how can you apply... Um, or how can you be in t more intentional about getting your strength in that particular, for t towards that skill or towards that experience or towards whatever it is that you need? 
For this one, I'm going to actually ask for a volunteer. I won't think we have the time to partner up, but I'll actually ask for a volunteer if somebody um, has a question about maybe a strength that they have and how they can really, really try and deepen it um, by being more intentional and targeting it towards one of these areas. The strength that I chose is connectedness. And so I'm interested to know, I've actually taken the those, those drinks finder and um, I don't get any orange ones until it's like 16, <laughs> but connectedness is in my top five. And so I'm not like a very strong, you know, activator or, um, or uh, like networker, like schmoozer, I'm not super good at small talk, but I have this strength of connectedness, being able to see like how to add value by connecting sort of disparate things and finding patterns. And so I'm curious like what skills could make, what skills make connectedness stronger um, and how I get them, because I'm not a natural schmoozer, I guess. <laughs> So everyone heard the question, right? So what, what, what kind of skills can make connectedness stronger, right? So I think one is, um, you know, in organizations today, purpose is something that may or may not be lacking in some organizations. But um, that's a really big area to try and flex some connectedness muscles. So you can help people see how, okay, fine, they're not the CEO, but even though they're on the front line, they have a place to play in the organization. So the connectedness. Um, another area is uh, that's probably pretty common, this notion of interdepartmental cooperation. So in other words, there are stovepipes and silos in organizations. Um, so that can be an area, um, you know, the kind of that skill of being able to talk to different people, convene different people together. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, any, is any of that, that, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, any other, um, any other volunteers? Sure. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. So the, um, what she was talking about, and she said, well, I, my, my orange is down the list. So there's four domains of Clifton Strengths. Right, there's four domains. Thinking, influencing, executing, relationship building. Thinking, executing, influencing, relationship building. So of those four domains, of your 34 themes, there is a domain that you are dominant in, and there are other domains that you are lesser dominant in. So in other words, um, she mentioned connectedness. That is a that is a relationship building theme. Her other relationship building themes are, sorry, it's an influencing theme rather. Her other influencing themes are lower down the list, but that is, that is one, if you will, dominant way that she tries to influence others is by understanding how she's connected to them, okay? Yeah. That's, it's actually a really important one because there's another, um, sometimes if, you, if you're doing coaching and you talk to CEOs, and they actually don't have any executing themes, or they, they, they come across as relationship building or influencing, they start to freak out because they're you know, chief executive officer and without any ex executing themes. But it doesn't mean, so Cliff and Strengths are not a job description, right? It doesn't mean that you can or can't do a role. It means it's how you do the role, right? My other favorite example is, um, I once met a director of change management and his lowest theme, so his number 34, was adaptability. And he kind of, you know, he's like, Am I, should I just quit my job? And it's like, no, no, no. Because he had strategic really high, he had analytical really high, uh, he had ideation really high. Like, all of his top five, he basically lived in his head. And the reason that he was good at his job is because he could think about the different scenarios that change would, would introduce. Um, he would just get a little bit off track if the plan didn't go according to plan. But that's fine because actually that's what we're going to talk about next. Talent balancing. So this is this notion that sometimes we overuse our strengths. Right? So um, I'm going to just use myself as a quick example here. I've got competition number one. 
there have absolutely been times in my life where I have tried to win at something where no one else was competing, right? So it's just like, <laughs> calm down. We're not competing here. Um, so that's, that's kind of what that feels like. But I want to think about it like this way. Um, I would suggest that all of you are like stars, and I'm not trying to make a cheesy, corny point here. I'm just, just, just bear with me. Think about it that you are, you and your, your personality, your shapes, your talents are like a star. And chances are there are certain things that you know that you're good at, right? And we've gone so far. We know their strengths. We know if you are intentional about them and if you get good at them, that that's what makes your star shine. There's a problem, though, which is that our workplaces are really good at giving annual performance reviews and... I don't know about you, but most of my reviews, at least until I came to Gallup, most of my reviews were, yeah, you're really good at this, but you know, this is your area of opportunity. I was like, but I thought I was really good at that. It's like, no, 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 we need you to be well-rounded. Well, that's fine, but when you're constantly looking at your weaknesses, what you're really doing when you round yourself out is you're not shining anymore, and you're not bringing your unique gifts to the world. All right, there we go. But if you're not focused on those weaknesses, and you learn how to navigate some of those weaknesses, and you really can put your effort and your intention into your strengths, then what happens is your strengths get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, actually, um, in Jim's chairman blog today, this is basically what the, what the article is about, right? So this, this idea of we can get better and better at our strengths in perpetuity, um, and we can never, ever quite you know, manage our weaknesses effectively, but we can always get better and better at what we're really, really good at. Um, and whereas weakness, our weaknesses are just things that we have to manage around. And I'm also using this in two ways. So right, one thing is our weaknesses and the things that, we're, that we, just ways that we don't see the world, right? And the other way, which can also be a weakness, is then just overusing our strengths uh, that we have. Um, so again, let's, let's take a look at an example here about that. So there are a number of, of, of points in time um, when, we're, um, when we're investing in our strengths, right, when we're, when we're aiming them, where we get really good. And so that's why we've highlighted the skill up there. That is really what you're after when you're trying to use your strengths, this idea that you can deliver near perfection time and time again, right? That's what you're after. The issue is that sometimes that doesn't always happen. And actually, I think it was Chris back there. This is where I want to use your, do I, can I use your example? So he runs an organization and he said that uh, one of the strengths that he has is activator, which you can certainly appreciate, like, Chris is getting things done, right? I want to go work for him because I like to get things done too. But I think the issue he was describing is he also has limited time. And when he overactivates, right, he can be doing things that maybe other people in the organization can do, and he's not spending his time on the things in the organization that only he can do, right? So he's overusing his one strength of activator, um, to the point where instead of it being this idea of him being a star or this, this light that he can bring to other people, it can also be a shadow, right? So it can also be something that's getting in the way of his success. And so he's got to recognize that and he's got to say, okay, well, what are, what are some ways that I can control that talent? What are some ways um, that I can work around it? So I'm getting the good out of it, but I'm also aware of, of where it can lead me astray. And in that same notion, right, because somebody also asked me about weaknesses, weaknesses function a little bit similarly. We need to be aware of, of what they are, but we just want to work around them. We just don't want to let them get in the way. And that's really it. We don't need to, we don't need to master our weaknesses, right? I'm, I'm really, really not talented at handiwork. Um, so, right, I probably need to maybe do enough so I don't have to always have to pay a carpenter to do a project, but at the same time, I you know, probably shouldn't go and like 
you know, renovate a bathroom or something like that, right? So you've got to, you got to, I, I never need to, have to get that good at it. I just need to get good enough to, to manage or to work around it. So a little practice. Just think for a moment about which, are, which of those talents you have or the talent that you chose that you think you're sometimes using too much. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, because um, we're gonna, we have to wrap up in just two minutes, but I'm gonna ask for um, maybe two volunteers or one volunteer, depending, but ask for another volunteer. Um, the talent that we, that we use too much and then um, kind of where you think it shows up. Hi. Um, so I have ideation, and that's like a really fun place to hang out, but you can just kind of spin in that space for a really long time. So not getting too caught up with ideas, but, you know, focusing on execution at some point. Awesome. That was a perfect example. Uh, one of my talents was includer and bringing people along in a process. And I think at a certain point that could be overused and start to overshadow my own ideas that I might be bringing to the table if you're sort of always bringing so many folks in. I like that one a lot. Because um, I think sometimes we, we, we discount the perspectives or what we're bringing to a situation. So... I did tell you I was going to um, help you to understand this. So how can I, whether I'm using a talent too much or whether I have a weakness, how can I, how can I mitigate it? Um, don't worry, I'm not going to give you a, a cheesy sports analogy. But relevant question, I'm going to do a quick show of hands. Has anybody seen the documentary Last Dance? Okay, Good number of you, okay? Um, for those of you that want a shortcut, you can just watch episodes, I think, 9 and 10, because there's 10 episodes. So not all of us have 10 hours, but um, enough of you have seen it. So the reason I bring it up is because that uh, entire series, and it, you know, it focuses on, on, um, on Michael Jordan a little bit, but it actually has a, the answer in terms of how do you, what's the best way for you to either um, not you overuse your strengths or to how can you manage your weaknesses and the title here kind of gives it away right so it talks about um, at various moments right Jordan may or may not have been accused of of being a good team member or not being a good team member um, but one of the ways that it, that, that it comes across again if you're sympathetic to the to the filmmaker's point of view is that when he was in practice, I mean, he was on his teammates constantly, even in practice, and really intense. What are you doing? You got to do it better. Always on them, right? He was being really, really competitive. And again, it comes across in some other moments um, in his career as well. But he was using that competition in order to be the best teammate that he could really be. But it wasn't until, again, if you, if you, if you, um, if you see the movie, uh, or the, the docu documentary, rather, he had some moments in time where he was really just, you know, his teammates hated about them even in the early days of his career, but there was a chip that, he, that, he, that, that switched, and it was that he was always trying to compete, always trying to win, but when the Bulls were able to make the jump from always going to the playoffs and losing to the Pistons to going to the playoffs and starting to win, it was when he brought that competition and he started to truly make his teammates better and truly try and partner with them, truly tr be on them, but for the spirit of improvement, as opposed to just be, being in it to win, right? So he, was, he, he learned how to use that competition. He learned how to use his competition in order to try and get the, 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 the best out of his teammates, as opposed to when he was overusing it. He was just saying, you know, it's got to win, 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 but it wasn't necessarily aimed at them. So that part of, of strengths, that part of managing our talents and weaknesses is really important because you've got to um, be present and you've got to understand, right, what are the situations that are going to have me be a better member of this team or what are the situations where maybe I'm, I'm, I'm 
contributing or, or subtracting from the team. But there was actually one more piece. I think this is episode 10. Um, and it's my, it's my favorite, uh, favorite point, and this is what we're going to wrap up on because it's, it's the one thing I want you to remember the most. Um, and I forget who the, who the author or the speaker was at that point. But they talked about, um, okay, obviously it's Michael Jordan, right? So you could say the reason why he was so great was because of his talent at basketball, his athleticism, his competition, a number of things which to that point were very evident in the documentary. But at the very end of it, they suggested that the one thing that made him so great, that made him more great than anything else, was his level of presence, right? And they gave a couple of examples, but he was just completely absorbed in the moment, not worried about the future. And when you're not worried about the future, you tend to be able to make that game-winning shot. You tend to be able to really focus what you're doing. You tend to be able to be at your very, very best when you're just kind of lost in the moment. And so as you're getting your acquainted with strengths and as you're wondering what do I do and, and how can I use this, et cetera, et cetera, um, and even, again, to the point of where we started, you know, if you kind of find yourself maybe on that curve of that rising tides of sadness that we, that we found, sometimes you just got to lose yourself in the moment and you got to do what you're good at. And when you're working on your strengths, then you start to live hope a little bit more.